Wait, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And uh, we are going live right now. Here we go. Yo, what's up? Cool. Here we are. Everybody, welcome. We are all the way live. Uh, Geo is on the road right now, and we really appreciate everybody waiting here for this. We are with Grit Cult, the great Grit Cult. It is a great pleasure to be here as always. Breaktherules.tv. Subscribe, all the new people who are watching this. Anyway, Grit Cult, I've been following your work for a while now, and uh, you are a uh, high performance cult sultan. Cult sultan that you call yourself, cult creator for hire. You're coming in from England, and I would love for you to just tell us about how you found yourself in the corner of the internet you're currently in, the origin story. Let's go for it, my friend, and thank you so much for coming in. All right, thank you. Um, I was actually sent here from the future um, to correct humanity's path that, um, you know, they've, they're going down. Um, as you can see, it's, it's currently going really badly. No, so really, um, how it started was, you know, you're like coming in how anyone started, you don't start at the bottom of this rabbit hole, you slowly get there and you tumble down. So, um, yeah, back in my normie days, um, if I was ever a normie, um, it, it was just very much onto a, um, you know, as soon as I went to university, I, I, spent, I was spending more time on uh, Twitter a couple of years ago now, a very long time ago, um, and I was just kind of using it to network within the London kind of creative kind of sphere. And, you know, I was meeting a lot of people, but it, it got kind of stagnant and I was, wasn't was too happy in terms of, um, you know, the kind of direction um, I was going in the creative scene. Um, you know, I had a film production company, a video production company, worked with a lot of artists, a lot of like, you know, creative sphere people. Um, and then I was just like, oh, this, this is kind of, you know, turning kind of sour. And I wasn't really enjoying the, you know, the business side of it. It wasn't you know, uh, wetting my appetite, so to speak. And essentially, we went down, um, I personally yes, went down a route where and... um, I was entering another kind of phase within university, um, you know, two, three years later. And then I decided to kind of completely rebrand, drop my previous branding and, uh, you know, unfollow those people and just like kind of take myself in a different direction. And then I started like making threads in around 2018. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the threads I was kind of making, I was exploring this kind of crypto space at the same time. This is, this is around the crypto, um, the previous crypto bull run. So I was getting a lot into, into um, crypto economics and I was getting a lot into Austrian economics and all this new kind of, um, you know, streams of thought that in my quite, you know, self-admittedly um, left-leaning um, Keynesian kind of university, um, it was quite, you know, different, it was quite new and I'm, I'm very attracted to new ideas and new ways of thinking. And I always found myself, you know, on the outside per se, um you know exploring you know newer ideas rather than you know staying within the same kind of space so in in that regard and then i kind of was networking with a lot of people um in terms of they they were very much um you know they were very familiar with that kind of, with that kind of school of thought and then i just went deeper and deeper into the kind of um, rabbit hole whereby you know you, you go into um Friedman, and then you go into libertarianism, and then you come out of crypto. Then you, then you, and you explore, you know, um, other aspects that are quite adjacent, such as um, very right-wing thought. And um, I'm hesitant to call it fascism, but some people would probably do that. But then again, they use that label and everything, rendering it meaningless. So, yeah, that's how I explored a lot of different um, streams of thought, and have generally been interested in that. Um, so that was around 2018 when I first kind of used uh, Monica Grit Cult. And I've, um, in a sort of hyperstition kind of way, um, I've just kind of embodied that more and more. Um, and then, you know, just playing alongside people, um, just, you know, put through positive feedback, just kind of leaned into this kind of identity, if that makes sense. And when you got into this kind of an identity, were you able to make a business for yourself as far as uh, getting people to consult for and what was it like when you talked with these people as far as reaching out to them while at the same time reaching out to people in this more online sphere? This is kind of what we try to do with uh, BTR. So I'm curious what your experiences there have been and how you see this differentiation today between the uh, 
normie sphere, for lack of a better word, and uh, this uh, more online sphere where, I mean, just now we were having a very interesting conversation and uh, I find the solution as far as uh, what was proposed with like uh, women, uh, women's rights and like the beating of women and so on and so forth to be absolutely ghastly. While at the same time, these are not conversations that would be able to take place in normal office environment. So I'm curious where you, uh, you know, where you lie on this uh, current uh, divide right now. Um, so the real, the, the, just to summarize your own point, so there are three real kind of questions you got there. So in terms of, um, you know, how I got here, um, you know, is there such a thing as normies? And, um, you know, previous topic we talked about before going live, which is essentially um, this whole topic around, uh, you know, female rights, so to speak. Um, and we are going to be getting into female rights at six o'clock. But anyway, go for it. So essentially... The first kind of question in terms of consulting, um, yeah, so especially now, a lot of people are reaching out to me. Um, the crypto space is quite, it's, it's bubbling quite hot, mainly because they have gained quite a lot of cash assets and they don't know how to effectively expend that kind of resource. So as a person that's worked with, you know, very large corporations, it's, um, you know, it's, it's not too difficult. People are approaching me. I don't have to go out and prospect. For a lot of businesses, you have to go out, you have to find, all right, here, you know, people, you have to knock on a lot of doors, and you do this whole salesman kind of stick, uh, stick, as they say. Um, so yeah, so it, like a lot of people are reaching out to me on Twitter, um, you know, saying like, "Hey, I've got this business problem." Usually, I I'll just get on a call with them and like I'll probably solve it there and then on the call and basically be like, um, you know, "Hey, you know, this is what you should do. This is probably best." And if they want me on a retainer, and uh, that we can discuss that. I'm personally moving away from the kind of retainer kind of model. Uh, mainly because it's not as fruitful as it once was. And, um, you know, there are better deals to be made and constructed. And the whole deal-making kind of thing is, is a very creative exercise whereby, um, you know, if someone has a problem and you solve it, you, know, you can negotiate a lot of things. And negotiation is a very um, unstriated kind of thing. Um, you are restricted by a lot of laws and legality in the sense of, you know, um, in, in the bureaucratic, bureaucratic sense. But however, if you are to construct a deal, let's say in, in Malaysia, whereby you both hold 50% of a company that's you know, structured through various corporations, then you you know, you know you can make a lot more money, you can do a lot more creatively. Um, you know, th there's just loads of like, for me, I, I, I'm a, I'm, I see this whole consulting kind of thing as a exercise in creativity. Um, and, you know, I was talking to a few of the creatives, I was on um, Contain, and I was even on some like memetic podcast whereby, you know, they were asking me about the, um, you know, how to start an agency, how to solve problems for people, and you know, how to consult. And I say, you know, you, you literally, you, you just find a pain point and you, you you approach people or they approach you, and you just solve it. You solve the problem. That's essentially it. So, it's how to get into it. I, I suppose it's um, become very good at what you do um, and get known for it and just provide a lot of free value and get on people's radars. And then they'll naturally gravitate towards you. Um, that's probably the easiest way. Me personally, what I kind of did, I I was on Twitter. I, I was doing a lot of reading and a lot of writing, and I decided that this probably wasn't going to be most fruitful in long term. So I kind of went away for a bit and just focused on the more corporate kind of side, developing hard skills that are very now transferable in my opinion. Um, so uh, you know, it depends where you are in your journey, really. You know, if you already got a skill set. If you're already, you know, X amount of years old, then it's probably more fruitful to, you know, do something else or, you know, take another strategy. That's how I kind of got there. In terms of normies, the second kind of part of your question, um, I personally believe that um, normies are slowly being extinct. There's, instead of it, you know, at first it's like you could recognize a normie now, it's just varying, varying degrees of norminess. So, for instance, I'd probably suppose that anyone who is an, um, like a furry, they would call all non furries normies, right? So it very much typically depends on your own in-group. Um, so, you know, the LGBT, sorry, to keep going on and on. So that, for instance, the LGBTQ people, um, you know, they, they see normal straight people as, um, uh, you know, normies, let's say, um, and they themselves are not normies. So I, I suppose it's, a, it's quite a derogatory term that people use um, in the sense that, you know, or they are outsiders, we are insiders, we are special. And we hold some sort of, um, you know, inner status, which in you know niches and subcultures, you know, that typically tends to happen as it as it goes out to the wider audience. It starts to get diluted, and you can see that, you know, with a lot of 
um, you know, movements. But um, that's so like I think it's a varying degree. I don't think anyone is 100% normal anymore. I think that time has passed. The um, the essential touch points of people being able to like not be radicalized or touch something that's really extreme has you know has gone. You know I think everyone now is in some way radicalized in some fashion, and I think the whole 2016 experiments have you know demonstrated that everyone is online now. Um, I'm not sure if uh, necessarily radicalization would be a marker if somebody is a normie or not. I mean, it, well, you I could say this is, yeah? I was going to say I use the term <laughs> all the time somewhat ironically, but I mean, I think it's, um, hmm, sorry, my mind is elsewhere, obviously. I'm just waiting for the killer. <laughs> so, so, yes, G Gio, Gio's got a prep over here. We got to give him a massage. We got to give him a back rub. Well, you know, the old, the old rub down in preparation for um, going against a Ayla girl. I still can't pronounce that name correctly. Ayla, Ayla. Uh, but anyway. Uh, well, why my account's locked? I'm worried about the army of uh, gooners that are going. Oh uh, yeah, the coomers um, and the gooners. Yeah, the, uh, the gooner oh, slugmen. Yeah. I See, mean, that's this what Grit Call was talking about. That's like sort of the language of. Uh, self-identification being made rather than being attributed to someone like something that is ostensibly an ironic term like gooner would be almost like a term of uh like almost like a counter discourse and i noticed like what like um how shall i say this grit called i think you were like the first like m bigger account that followed me back this was a while ago and i think like what you really, what you're interesting is that, <laughs> sorry, I'm tripping over words. You're interesting because I think you really understand um, the way in which identity is formed on the internet. Like you've really managed to sort of spread yourself out across different accounts and create like almost, I would say a mystique of like grit call, you know what I mean? Like the threads intertwining into threads, the different, uh, different uh, sub accounts. And it's like this labyrinth of grit call. And I feel like, like, how did you discover this? Obviously, like you were working in the corporate world, uh, but it's just to me, it's fascinating. The whole like grit cult. Um, I know I'm sorry, sounds and, kind and of and you're uh, using a lot of here, you know, <laughs> and you're using a lot of robots as well, right? A lot of different bots. I noticed on Discord, there's like a whole section, like a whole rank for the bots and uh, what they do. So you're you've cybernetic yourself here, it seems, and. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious uh, how exactly that's been uh, that's been working out so far, and would you recommend it to others as well? Um, I, I I would say yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. It's quite. I mean, I, I don't know. I was doing quite a lot of things just now. So I mean, one of the main topics is yeah. I am quite like everywhere, I suppose, uh, mainly because I am very much interested in finding and seeking out new ideas and new people, and essentially learning from them and you know their kind of mental models, and you know basically like trying to reinterpret them. So, yeah, I, I, I suppose a lot of my, like, even how I post will change because I'm kind of running like a back end kind of experiment. All right, I'll do this for X amount of time and people respond in X, Y way. So I, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, trying to engage feedback. Yeah, I mean, I, I do remember um, I followed you back in like 2018 or the late end of 2018, Gio, and essentially. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? No, I was going to say those are the days. Uh, <laughs> things are quite different now, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, I, and I, and I kind of like that about Twitter. It's that fact it's constantly changing. And the very nature of that, it, me it means that I'm always going to meet new and, new, new and different people. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm meeting a lot of people that are very adjacent to this whole, uh, you know, finance kind of world, the whole crypto space. And um, like seeing like being the kind of person that introduces people in very different spheres to one another that's that's very like engaging for me personally so um there'll be one guy from you know right wing twitter let's say interacting with some guy from like finance twitter and interacting and you know this whole new sphere like you know it's, it's uh the amalgamation of which you know it produces the best of both worlds in a sense and i'm a big proponent of mimetics i don't know if you guys have read much of my tweets on it but essentially um, you know, there's, there's a constant selection pressure of memes being constantly, you know, being tested and retested. So um, I'm totally of the belief that, you know, cultures, subcultures will rise and die. Um, and on Twitter, it, it's a very fast paced kind of sphere, right? Like every six months, I think it's a totally different space. 
um, and you know, like the way you post changes, the algorithm changes, and you know, boom, you know, some people might get sniped out, and you know, they'll be losing their accounts, and you know, they'll do the whole F chain and stuff. But like for the guys I hear, you know, it must be for a good reason. You know, we're ordained by God in some sense. Well, you have a very interesting tweet over here. A neoliberalism will die, not, not by ideology, but by technology. Crypto capitalism will fracture and swallow up the neoliberalism that is being pushed. No NFT, no looky, no touchy. This guy's living <laughs> in the 90s, LOL. So the tweet that you're responding well, to well, here. Isaac said yeah. that liberalism will oh, last uh, the sun exploding. So I, I don't know. Well, Where's what's that? this? Tw well, what's the tweet that he's responding to here? This is by Sam Bowman. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, director of competition policy at uh, uh, Law Economist Center, e editor of WorkInProgress.co, uh, and he identifies as a neoliberal. And he says you'd have to be a very strange, inconsistent libertarian to oppose this. Private businesses being able to refuse entry to customers who might put others at risk of infection seems like a total no-brainer if you think freedom of association matters. So uh, you are saying that he's living in the 90s because crypto capitalism will fracture and swallow up neoliberalism. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So essentially, um, what we'll so liberalism is the kind of ideology that, you know, there should be free everything, free trade, um, you know, free movement of people, and there's it's going to be this whole expanse that is correct in some regard but again it 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 goes against it what's the kind of trend that we're facing now whereby we are we are going from a place where we had like open fields and, and these are the best kind of analogies to use you know in terms of like ecologies so we'd have like an open kind of field where you know nomadic people would just come in and come out and you can just literally you know go across the entire internet without any restriction but now what we're facing or we're going into is a sort of walled garden whereby, you know, there'll be some sort of um, nature whereby there, there will be some sort of nature where, you know, it'll be like walled gardens. So we're already seeing this with, um, you know, China. Um, China essentially has a firewall, the Great Firewall of China. Um, what's going to happen is crypto is going to um, eat, up, um, eat up a lot of that kind of space. So we're seeing that with NFTs as well. So instead of being able to copy and paste things, it'll be a lot harder to um, digitally reproduce, um, you know, content in a sense. Um, you, you're going to get a lot more pay, paid um, paywalls. So mm. what, what, what I mean by that, so instead of content being free and accessible, whereby you could, you know, you could, you know, basically pirate software. Now, you know, we, we've kind of got on over that hurdle where, you know, software is no longer free. In fact, you know, people are paying more and more for it on a subscription kind of basis. Well, um, some some people, I don't know. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's the the nature of which it's just becoming more and more normalized. So Twitter now is it's, it's going to become monetized. So you can make money from Twitter directly. You won't have to go to third word, um, third party kind of uh, people whereby um, you know they'd be like Patreon. It's third party in my in my opinion. Um, you're not exactly directly. I mean, you are making contact directly on Twitter, but it's not your um, main method of um, discovery in a sense. Well, that was something that Twitter attempted to do recently. I mean, people say that the uh, recent ban waves was not because of that, but it was just because of some other stuff related to the algorithm. But, uh, Geo, do you think that there is a certain portion of uh, these bans that was because Twitter wants to implement this new tweet for uh, payment, but as a result... Yeah. But as a result, they don't really want there to be people like Metaphor Man or people who would, you know, be funny, entertaining. And well, take, they don't uh, want they don't yeah. want um, Grape or 18, 1488 to make uh, money off of tweets. But I don't know. I feel like the norm has been for so long. Uh, content has to be free and it will find a way. But perhaps now, maybe, you know, with the crypto sphere, people will pay for the content they want, but like, let's face it, the people that are going to have super tweets or whatever they call it, they'll be like journalists, basically, you know, having a Onanist party with other journalists. I don't think, unless you're like a prolific poster, I don't really think that um, the average person that is, a you know, someone who is like a dissident is going to like 
get monetized for tweets. But that being said, I, I'm curious to know um, what Grit Call thinks. I'm the neoliberalism thing. I mean, that's a that's like a whole show in itself. I mean, that's Nick Land's point as well. But I'm um, to go back to the meme culture thing. Do you do you think that having had experience with crafting and testing and like really you know being behind the scenes in terms of how memetics operate just by the sheer number of posts and accounts and bots and and experiments that you've run and polls do you think that this sort of um this sense of like where the the well for lack of a better term the guest do you think that it's almost in some ways um like an impersonal intelligence behind it as you know kind of crazy and out there as it sounds like is there some type of hyperstitional thing going on or do you think it's pure chaos and it's purely organic or is it being manipulated by forces like for example twitter can clip however many accounts they want but then anons you know find a way to come back and then memes change and they become more elaborate and they have to sort of adapt evolutionarily to certain selection pressures of censorship but do you think that there's i don't know some kind of like capital itself that's sentient do you think like memes themselves are sentient in some ways uh, as crazy as it sounds no yeah i've um i've had a lot of people talk to me about that in fact some polish guy was mentioning it after reviewing some of my writing um, actually, I found out today. Hmm. So I'm just eating some lasagna. Um, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> so essentially, um, is it sentient? Is it a, you know, a super intelligence from the future? I probably think not, um, mainly because it's, it, it's very hard to falsify and verify that kind of theory. It's, I mean, I think it's pretty interesting to think about, you know, is Bitcoin a... Um, super intelligence seeding itself and Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, was a, you know, um, was a computer intelligence from the future. Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible, but the degree of possibility is quite low. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't exclude any possibility out from, you know, so, sort of thinking. So uh, I, I, I definitely think that, you know, the selection pressure definitely changes the kind of discourse. Um, what we're kind of seeing now is a lot of people are trying to access this and see this and they kind of recognize that the fact that you know it is able to change um I, th- I think also like what jung basically um was talking about when he talked about the collective unconscious <clears throat> collective unconscious it's, it's essentially the whole notion um behind you know shared kind of evolutionary history in my opinion um, and that's what he got, kind of got wrong um but i mean to touch on that is it I, I don't think that the memes are sentient in a sense. Uh, I, I definitely think that they have a lot more power than people think. I think, like, you know, these kind of symbols are constantly keep coming up and up, um, you know, mainly because they mean something to us on a deep, um, inherent level that we might not even know about. Um, for instance, we, like, you know, people can find cartoons attractive, uh, which is kind of crazy to me, but, um, you know, to some people, that's, you know, that's normal. Um, Dude, that's so bad. Uh, oh. don't, don't get me started on posting certain things in the uh in the uh, discord chat over here oh, i'm so tempted to post that image of king of the hill hang hill with uh what's her name slappy the squirrel and it's a safe it's a safe oh. for work picture but uh I, I i get what you're talking about here grit cult i mean i don't know i think that um I'm more in the line of there being some panpsychism going on, like I think that everything is a thought or a dream or whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter as much to me as uh, where are we going to go right now as society? Going back to that cold question about like the wife beating and children meeting and that uh, stuff, uh, which I know uh, was just something that kind of it kind of took me by surprise that this was even going to be something that we're going to be talking about over here. But I am kind of curious about your 
views <laughs> on the future here. Uh, where, did, where did that come up, by the way? Well, it came up in that whole chat that we had in Twitter. You didn't see oh, it. You missed yeah. this whole thing with uh, all these all these fucking people talking about uh, how it's uh, actually Lindy to beat your wife and kids and how... Well, they didn't use the word Lindy. I use it. But the idea here is that they think that this is something that would keep society from degenerating, uh, you know, with liberalism and stuff like that. And as someone, you know, who knew people who back in the USSR, you know, the way that they grew up is they had their parents beat them up. They had, uh, they were actually poisoned by their, by their own family. So to have instances like this happen and to say like, oh, we're just going to, for that, we're still going to trust the family to take care of itself. No intervention whatsoever in these kind of cases. And in the way they see it as keeping society in line to have this kind of great chain of being i don't know what the future is going to bring so i'm curious what you think the future is going to bring and if you think that they may have some kind of point when it comes to um uh when it comes to all these things like one guy over here he says once the ball oh wait, wait, wait one second i just want to uh read this once the ball is rolling enforcement is decentralized the cultural stigmas keep everyone within a range of behavior an overton window if you will an authority need only concern itself with extreme deviancy with direct punishment banishment so that i think talks to the core of why people are concerned about liberalism in general uh again i think that beating people up uh, who are weaker than you is absolutely degenerate but uh uh, Grit called. I'm curious, what do you think of that, and where do you think the future lies here? Um, okay, so question one: Where do what do I think of that? I think it's um, it's a very interesting proposal. Um, I'm just reading the comments. Quite funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you said, all right. Go ahead, Joe. No, no. Just that the family unit was different, and it was much more of a communitarian type of thing um i don't know i think i i guess you could say that a lot of um like this is what zhp said with alex kashuda even our conceptions of like tradition itself is a way of dealing with modern alienation like the whole notion of being trad itself is like a modern invention because our ancestors didn't think of themselves as trad i, I don't know i mean We'll see that I, I don't want to eat up grit yeah, cults. Yeah, 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 yeah. What we're going to talk about. But I, no, but I, I, but I think it does relate to grit cults of views yeah. on, on this whole thing, especially oh, how yeah. grit cult sees the future in relation to how society changes. So I think yeah. it is still, even though it's out of the way of uh, grit cult himself, I still think it's related to his views. Um, I, I've definitely touched upon it and talked about it in some regard. Um, I definitely think that it's um, the future essentially is going to be more fractured. Um, so you, you're gonna you're gonna find instances. I, I, I always try to draw up the analogy of like the Flintstones and Jetsons living alongside each other. So you'll have like you know the coastal elite, um, you know Jetsons, um, you know very neoliberal and they're eating um, soy burgers or whatever. You know you know in their Jetson car in the future, flying Teslas or some shit. And then you also have the like the Flintstones, which could be the Kaczynski type followers or the Amish. I don't know. So I think you, you're you essentially going to have both of these kind of things happening at once. And not only those two things, it's going to be, uh, you know, a huge amount of m many different ideologies, you know, cross pollinating one another and interacting one, one, with one another. So the future, I don't think is very um, linear in that sense. It's not, it's not very linear. So like there will be instances of increased and both decreased um, you know, wife beating, depending on the demographic you're looking at. And I think what's going to happen is that demographics are not going to coalesce into one, you know, big, you know, happy family. They're going to, you know, fracture. So people are already seeing that. So with the political, so like politics are basically fracturing. A lot of people are, you know, going into different weird niches, um, you know, different fringes. And no one can really say the left or right anymore, mainly because there's so many different tangents that, you know, that can sp um, spiral out of those. Um, so you're good. So is this like the, in the Time Machine novel, the Eloy and the Morlocks? Or are we talking even more uh, split apart? So there would be yeah, that's whole different branches of Morlocks and different branches of Eloy and right. like some people in between. I mean, it's so weird to even, and I, I get it because even though we are connected, we're also disconnected at the same time. But you don't think that there's going to be any kind of overarching 
culture makers out there, some kind of elites that can dictate at least a certain level of civility towards society. You think it's just going to be completely fractured, everybody doing whatever they want no, uh, within, their, within, within their bounds, so to speak. Yeah, the, the, I, I personally think that there will be, you know, elites, there always will be, mainly because, you know, to reach a hierarchy, you're going to have to, um, you know, have some sort of ability to um, accumulate resources. Um, so, yeah, there will always be elites, but there'll be more elites in the sense that they'll be, you know, more, um, you know, controlling their own certain fractured kind of tribe. So I suppose in a sense, it's going to end up like a, you know, sort of feudalistic kind of society where like there'll be many different kings um, and, you know, lots of different fractured lands. And, you know, even who knows, even America may fracture. Well, that's like the uh, patchwork model of Moldbug. But the one thing that uh, makes me uh, reconsider that is the idea that one little patch of the patchwork will decide to take over another one and so on and so forth. So what is exactly there to stop that from happening at a certain point? Was it to stop that from happening at a certain point? Um, like my question in regards to that would be, why would that be a bad thing? Um, and, you know, that's always that's always kind of happened in history. I think people are going to compete. I think there is going to be competition. But one thing I'll try to reframe it as is how, how, how do you form a sort of competition that that um, limits, uh, let's say, violence? So, for instance, the blockchain or the sovereign individual kind of ideology basically says that states will compete, but they'll compete on um, what's it called bureaucracy or they'll compete on, um, I can't remember the actual term for it, but um, yeah, governance. So they'll compete on governance. So the comp the country or whatever you want to call it, the state, um, the sovereign state or whatever you want to call it, um, like wh whichever produces the most kind of incentive for the person to move to, they will move to that. In my opinion, um, I don't I don't know in terms of, in terms of um, time scale that's going to happen. We're already kind of seeing it. So companies are trying to attract remote workers. Uh, I know there was some sort of um, initiative in Czechoslovakia where the Czech Republic. I don't know what they call it now. Um, you know, whereby you know they're trying to attract remote workers, and you have like a year free tax. You don't have to pay any tax in um, the Czech country. Um, you know, Dubai. I know a lot of people in the UK are actually moving to Dubai. Some of my colleagues actually live in Dubai and work there. I'm personally thinking of moving to say Thailand. Uh, I already know a few people out there. Uh, a lot of people from America are moving to South America, Latin America, whatever you want to call that area. Um, but essentially, what we're, what we're already seeing is on a very small scale is this whole kind of like Tim Ferriss kind of model of working whereby, you know, you'll do a very niche kind of thing and you're trying to sell to as many people as you can. And you're trying to like make $1 profit on each person's interaction with you. Um, and, you know, just increase the number of transactions that you have. And I think that's the kind of way the world's kind of going. Um, there'll be a huge kind of market. But again, um, in terms of the competition, I'll try to reframe it and say, um, what's the oh, you, you got to keep closer kind of to the mic, by the way, you're kind of going in and out. Okay, yeah, we'll do. Well, uh, I, uh, I think that that may be what's going to happen as far as how to prevent a lot of this uh, warfare from occurring. Again, going back to people who would uh, disagree with, let's say, something like a blockchain being enough to keep that nature at bay. Because they see that nature, the nature of being violent as being something that is inherent to uh, the human uh, being. And that we can't just exorcise this quality away. So the question is, how do we, uh, how do we end up using that violent tendency for something good? I don't know if that's even possible. But I just don't see it going away. I mean, even now, it seems like that's a niche that people can't seem to scratch. Like during the summertime, all the riots that have been going on, you know, people uh, have this tendency. I, I, I would say I, I would say that's quite surface level in the sense that that is happening on the surface, but the general trend is that fact that it's actually um, decreasing the large part. So you're going to have more of these kind of blip events whereby, oh, you might have a riot every now and again, but the general trend is like day-to-day -day life is becoming less violent and it's becoming more muted in certain instances. So I, I call this kind of reframing, like uh, I call it the black tail, or a fat tail society. Fat tail is, you know, it's a very... Um, there's going to be an increase in number of random events, and so the world is going to become more chaotic, and the um, the world is becoming more chaotic. And 
what, what that essentially means is there's going to be more randomness. So I think like the the biggest kind of thing in our the last 20 years, um, aside from 9/11, was the you know Trump kind of winning, and um, a lot of people you know were disturbed by that. But that kind of pushed it in the sense that it's it's become more and more normal this whole random kind of thing. And you know, and then we had this huge lockdown, and through the lockdown, a lot of technolo- technological trends are you know coming up. So just to continue, you sorry. Think that, um... Oh, sorry, Greg. Call it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to ask. Do you think that um, these, hmm, to use like the language of <laughs> like crypto people and Nick Land, do you think that these sort of feedback loops are going to increase in intensity, and therefore it'll get harder for like any one agency to like take control of the narrative or? the direction by which history flows. Yeah, we're already kind of seeing that. So I, I think we're in a new Cold War right now. And you don't have just one agency fighting against one agency. So it's not Americans versus Soviets anymore. So you know, now it's like multifactorial and the barriers to entry are a lot lower. Um, you have a lot higher cost to direct conflict. So a, a lot of um, direct conflict is essentially... Um, you know, very costly to the person. And I, I think that's kind of like decreased. Um, so for instance, the most recent war in my kind of history was the um, Armenian um, kind of war that happened. And it was over within a couple of months and the, the losses were quite large and the amount of ground was quite large. And, you know, the bargaining chips were quite, like that kind of reshifting in the geopolitical sphere was quite big. Um, and a lot of people kind of missed that, in my opinion, but you know, that kind of signifies the way the world is going to trend you're going to see a lot more like random drone killings or whatever or random shootings i think that's going to increase but at the same time it's like your daily interaction with crime is going to decrease mainly because it's, there's not enough incentive to commit a crime so it'll be more you'll have more incentive to essentially um can this guy help me get can, can you <laughs> um I, I would say go to the gym mate um and take some zinc that help but yeah going back to my point um yeah it's, it's the feedback's already here like the feedback loop loop uh, shortening is already here like me and you we're talking uh we're we're on the other side of the world and the bunch of people i don't know where they are um you know yes. commenting on the youtube um, it didn't so. have to be this way by the way but for some reason i decided you know what let's have our discord be integrated with the youtube chat and let's just put that in the zoom screen so all of our guests get to see what all the people in the chat want to say no, 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 I, I, I quite, I, I like the feedback. That's why, like, sometimes I'm taking a pause. I'm just reading the comments and laughing internally. We have an optimism love right there. I mean, let's face. <laughs> oh man, but uh, on comments. Speaking of comments from a super iron Bob over here, uh, Trump winning was about there not being any political voice for the working class. That's a problem that isn't going away. So that is true, because like with all the things we're talking about right now people going over to you know brazil or uh wherever like different parts of the world a friend of mine who's a disney uh former disney visual effects animator he lives in this paradise absolute fucking paradise in costa rica uh you know with like fresh bananas growing on the trees every morning and mangoes it's fucking amazing i'll send you some uh, screenshots later (laughs) but anyway the thing here is that these are people who are able to make something of themselves in life and then go out and live in these uh, very nice environments and be more independent. But then you have people who I think do require much more, uh, you know, much more structure. They require there to be a community around them, people that they can rely on, uh, you know, kind of like an extended family. So these are also people who need something to do, you know, or they need to survive. And right now it seems that at least in America, a lot of them are going by... uh, welfare and uh you know all the drugs all the oxycontin all that kind of stuff so and they're not working you know they're not uh, the factory jobs not around anymore so this seems like a fuck ton of problems that are going to be headed our way soon when it comes to the working class uh what the fuck do we do um so yeah so there's a few interesting proposals in terms of policy if i don't know i mean there's a lot of things we could talk about so in terms of policy yeah, I think it's going to be inevitable that, you know, people are going to be more left out of the system 
Um, but then again, it's also going to be easier than ever to like, you know, start a business and make extreme um, returns by providing, you know, by solving a novel kind of problem. Um, what, yeah, I mean, in terms of communication, that's going to increase. Um, uh, like in terms of getting out there, I, I, in terms of, you know, if I wanted to give advice to someone who, you know, it, it feels as though that they are working class or they don't have opportunities, I would say look into online business and just start um, learning as much as you can in that regard and just actually try to figure out how large the internet actually is and how many people you have access to. You know, there's billions of people on the internet now. So, you know, if every, like, let's say a billion people on the internet gave you a dollar, then you'd be a billionaire technically. Um, so, so like, you know, it's very important to emphasize the kind of scale that you're dealing with and how easy it is to reach those kind of people. Um, and then, you know, once you have that kind of in there, you'd be able to essentially, um, what's it called, um, you know, use that as leverage. <clears throat> So, I mean, in terms of like class structure, I, th I think it's, it's, it's going to become more stratified. Um, it's harder. Gonna, it's going to be harder to go up the rungs, let's say. So the, the period of history where you had the American dream, roaring 20s, I think that, that may have come to a close whereby, you know, this may be your re last real chance in a very long time for your descendants to be, let's say, nobility. Um, and what you do in your lifetime right now may, um, you know, influence the future generations for about, factor of 10, uh, mainly because it's, um, you know, the whole crypto thing is going to stratify, stratify um, your social interactions, things are going to be harder to get by. So you're going to have, I'm kind of still forming in my mind, but you're going to have all these different costs. Um, so you can have the people that are going to essentially be stuck to one location, then there's going to be even more people that are constantly moving with no real, um, you know, location where they live. And I think, um, you know, renaissance europe or any you know area where you know trade was being fostered you always had like a nomadic kind of caste whereby you know they'd go out and trade and i think that's kind of happening and i think those kind of people that are moving around um you know they're probably making the right kind of decisions and getting out of their um environment where there's low opportunity to a place where there's high opportunity so i would also try to keep that in mind as well it's cheaper than ever to move to a place where there's higher um opportunity and the environment that you're in doesn't have to be the environment that you will die in. Um, those are the main kind of points. That what do well, you think of was... Cirrus? Oh, just real quick. What do you think of Cirrus Watch's comment? Nobody needs artwork or uh, what's FL Studio Beats or even programmers to survive? That is an illusion. So he was talking earlier about how the working class is going to be fine and the people who work from home will be the new uh, welfare class. The, the neat aristocrats, you mean? Like, such as yes. myself. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. But their level of existence will be quite... I don't know. It, it depends on your view of technology. It, you know, they, they may be, like, plugged in online all day. Um, to some people, that may you know, seem torturous. But if a person enjoys it, you know, that's up to them. I, I can't really comment too much on their personal preferences. Do you, do you so do you think that um, this sort of uh, <laughs> there was actually I remember back in like this was like the late nineties there was this uh, Panasonic trade book about like fashion like technology and it was called the New Nomads and they had this like typical nineties like rose colored Californian ideology view of the future and how like people are going to wear uh, like techno infused clothing. But I think the experience of technology is almost less somatic and much more inside yourself. Like you're staring at a black screen. It's not something that envelops you. It's something that envelops the site. I, yeah. I, 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 I disagree with the notion that it's not somatic. I think that there is a uh, mm. learn, learning curve for it to be you know, somatically integrated. I think there's a huge need for like haptic kind of feedback. And it's, it's slowly being integrated with time. Um, so one of the kind of points I make is that there is a kind of fractal kind of Lindy effect. So all the technology tends to stay and new technology is still being um, developed. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, so it's, for instance, technology that has been around for like 20 years. So that, that's more likely to stay for another 20 years. So, um, you know, large servers, um, that's, you know, they, they've been around for quite a while, um, but they're starting to be reduced or um, re-territorialize in a sense 
to you know decentralized ways, and then that will last for quite a long time as a base layer of technology. But in terms of somatic feedback, so one huge thing we've gotten is um, wireless phones, bro, wireless technology. So um, you know the fact that we've got rid of wires has made it more somatic. So for instance, I'm wearing an Oura ring that I, cha- that I charge like twice a week, um, and it tracks some of my metrics. So I've got an iPhone that I don't need to plug in every day, and it's wireless charging. I think that um, can counteract your argument that the fact is, it's, it is very, um, very much in the brain. I totally get that, but I don't think it'll totally, it'll always be like that. And I think that is a very large assumption in terms of human history. I think we definitely will have some sort of virtual world, virtual economy, mainly because that there will be the financial incentives to go into, like, let's say, Minecraft and mine stuff and, you know, essentially do that in that realm. Well, that, that's interesting. That's just a counterpoint because in, instead of like viewing um, technology as being beholden to a certain like logic of like whatever you want to call it, logic of late capitalist realism, where, you know, the one click Amazon thing is better for like the average uh, consumer individual than, you know, uh, what some virtual world model. But you're saying that technology in a way it's sort of, well, digital technology, it sort of has a, a, a rhyming effect. So we're maybe going to see like a return to that 90s optimism around fully somatic technology that's not just in your brain, but it's in your sort of, your visual view, your your senses, everything's going to be alive. We're going to have smell a vision maybe, who knows, right? A maybe. lot of careers, well, a lot of careers in media will die if there's uh, smell a vision. So. Uh. <laughs> Think, think of all the uh, sniff posting that people are going to be doing. But what my point was originally, um, but but you brought up a good point, Greg. Call my original point was that, do you, or rather, question was, you know, do you think that the new nomadic class, like that's going to be virtual, and rather, it's not going to be so much for traversing physical space, but the virtual will almost mimic physical space in some ways. Like the, the new like Magellans will be like a ship poster from the chans, you know? Oh God. That's, that's, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. That'll be smell vision right there. You'll get to smell bikini bottom in the future. <laughs> yeah. You'll get to smell Sandy, by the way, glass oh, cake is oh, over here God. in the, oh, uh, in the yeah. chat. Glass Cake, speaking of animation, Glass Cake is an amazing animator. I don't know, uh, Gret Cult, if you've seen his work, but he is also from a uh, uh, merry old England, and uh, he is he, he's just amazing, and I would love to have Glass Cake back real soon and uh, have a sewing discourse with Glass Cake as well. So here is his Twitter, follow Gla- James Cunningham, follow Glass Cake. But anyway, ha- have you seen the, his stuff yet or no? If not, I'll send you. Anyway. Uh, where was I? Sex robot, somebody saying sniff posting. Uh, I, my best example would be I put up this cartoon character that I don't even want to post right now because I think the person who drew him is crazy and I don't want to risk him taking the stream down. So this cartoon character had like it's like a squirrel uh, with the tongue sticking out. And this guy made another drawing of the bumps of the tongue. Like, he was that interested. Like, we were talking before about people who are, you know, interested sexually in cartoon characters. Well, this guy goes one step further and is interested in, like, something I've never even seen before. Like, the interest in the bumps of the tongue of the cartoon character. But please stop. No, no, but the reason why this is important is because we're talking about a virtual <laughs> world where people are going to be disconnected from each other, going to their own groups. Yes, so people will be the first to pioneer the virtual the uh, the virtual space the uh, exactly yes. just like porn and the VHS uh, VHS tapes you know it was because of pornography that VHS got popular from what I understand so I think a similar thing would be done around like this totally realistic technology of like being able to smell being able to feel but then the question is what happens to the physical you because I still think and I know people disagree with me on this I still think that there is something special to the human body the human spirit whatever where we like if we outsource our ability to sense things to smell see whatever to these virtual devices my concern is that we're fucking ourselves over because we don't really get to exercise our will on these things as opposed to them being done for us in this virtual space so I'm curious what you think about that 
No, I, I just think your model of humanity is kind of flawed because you're you're using a blanket statement for humanity itself. Um, you know, there's still people living in the Amazon tribes. You know, that I think it counteracts this whole notion that oh no, we're going to be slaves. We as a very large, broad statement. I, I don't like that's the main thing I have criticism I have with a lot of people is that they, they you know, they, they paint too broadly. Um, I think the vast majority of people may be in that or may not be in that. I definitely think it's going to be. I think some people are going to definitely prefer real life, um, just as you know, some Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, refuse blood transfusions. There's always going to be these kind of things. Obviously, we do kind of fear that capitalism is basically eating up all their ideologies and you know making them neoliberal. But the pendulum does swing the other way. In my opinion, there's there's going to be you know these kind of nomads that are essentially roaming of. Um, and they hate technology and they'll be raiding people, you know, who are um, essentially, you know, living on technology and their muscles have been weakened, but they're being cybernetically enhanced. So th there's going to be loads of things like that, um, in my opinion, or maybe not as visceral or violent like Mad like a Mad Max kind of scene. But essentially there, there will be, uh, you know, very much di like no, no one can say, um, you know, our right, history is going to go this way. No, I personally think we're in a very... Um, <clears throat> interesting point where it's, it's definitely going to go in multiple directions, you know. Um, <coughs> sorry, I've been talking for ages. So it's definitely going to go in a lot of different ways. I also think that um, techno optimism, optimism is slowly coming back. Um, there's always the class of, you know, the um, Silicon Valley coastal elites kind of people that have a very much a, um, oh yeah, you know, we're going to do, you know, do thing on Mars or something and like Tesla in space. Uh, I think that's slowly coming back into the um, main zeitgeist. Uh, it's coming back into vogue, uh, mainly because that they're realizing that technology, the hard problems, um, are like you know still being iterated on. And there's still a lot of potential. There was, I suppose, a innovation winter, uh, whereby we were still exploring, um, you know, views. They were still exploring kind of views whereby they essentially, you know, depict all the low hanging low hanging branches and then they'd have to do development and say, you know, machine learning and then machine learning took quite a long time to come back into, um, you know, the main kind of zeitgeist whereby technology has caught, kind of caught up. And then this whole um, aspect of demographics and infrastructure that also needs to be developed for, you know, technological innovation to take it to the next kind of step. So you, you and, and I think one of the main issues with Malthusian kind of thinking whereby Oh no, we're an overpopulate we're an overpopulation kind of state. Is that there is a there's a lag of innovation whereby their innovation you know has to catch up and there is a kind of bottleneck. But these kind of bottlenecks are resolved over time, mainly due to this notion of um, you know necessity being the mother of all invention. Well, it's interesting. We're we're talking about these uh, technological bottlenecks, but what about the people bottlenecks? As far as, I mean, we have Elon Musk, and it's funny, like, when people think, they probably do think, or at least I think of Elon Musk as an example of this uh, uh, tech optimism. And uh, when it comes to anybody else, like, who else is there that people would think of? Because it seems like, and again, this may be just bias living today and not really, you know, living, uh, I don't know, like 30 or 50 years from now, looking back at all these figures in the same way. But we could look at figures like Nikola Tesla, like Edison, like, uh, you know, all the uh, all the great Nobel Prize winners, uh, Heisenberg, whatever. We can look back at all these people and say, man, like these these centuries before our time, man, they produce some amazing motherfuckers. And now it seems like the little people are left. Uh, to pick up the pieces, and sure, there's technological innovation, but will that be enough if not for, uh, you know, if, if we don't have these bigger people on board as well? Or do we? That's the thing. Like, I don't know. Are they around? We just don't know about them. I'm, I mean, you, I mean, the kind of question that you're touching upon is the uh, great man kind of theory. Yeah, it's, which uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's uh, if if it's uh, a a valid theory or whatever you want to call it. But it, this is just a pattern that I'm noticing when I look back in time. I mean, I would say these um, these people have movements. Um, so you know, behind the great group of people, I mean, a great person. There's a group of people, in my opinion, and it's kind of network that they've arose from, rather than you know individual people. I think there will be 
you know, the main kind of connectors, the main kind of faces to the crowds, let's say, um, whereby they are the main kind of person or main point of contact to go to. Um, so I, I definitely think it's a, like, I, I wouldn't say it's just them on their own. I definitely think they're a huge part of it. But I would also say that their group and the community that they're around also is a huge part too. Well, your talk. I just want to make sure that I understand uh, what you're saying here. Are we talking about people being like Elon Musk, being like the face of something? My concern is that there aren't going to be enough people who are actually going to generate something interesting. And uh, and again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are plenty of people behind the scenes that are generating so much interesting stuff, and we just don't know their names. They just don't you know, vocalize themselves like a showman, like uh, Elon Musk does. Yes. Well, what, what yeah, is your relation to anime in general? Because it seems that a lot of these innovations came about from chains of anonymous people that were working throughout the centuries. Do you think that in some strange ways, is, is anonymity going to be like a huge force in the future? Or do you think that some kind of like, I don't know, like UN mandate will say that while these evil like racists are on the internet, so they're going to we're going to have like a docs and uh, we're going to have like a world ID where the only way you can access the internet is with like a personal uh, ID chain or something. Uh, but do you think that anonymity itself as a force will sort of aid or hinder any innovation in the future, whatever that means? Like the question itself of innovation and technology as such. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty interesting question. I would say that anonymity or being anonymous um, definitely helps innovation. I also think that it can also kind of hinder innovation in some regards, but probably lesser than the benefits it provides. Um, the, the main kind of hindrance is just um, being able to connect and network with people. I think that's a hugely underrated part of um, exchanging ideas, exchanging memes, and, you know, collaborating with people, I think that's a huge force in innovation and, you know, competition of memes essentially, you know, produces the best kind of results and ideas just through the selection pressure. Um, I, I think in the future, will the UN create some sort of UN identity? They can try, but again, it's, it's all about te technology. Well, like, it's, it's, it's not an ideological question, it's not a technological question because, you know, a person may want to ban all anons on the internet, but as long as there's a way to do, you know, being anon, um, people are going to do it. And, you know, that's a fact of life, I think, you know, people made it harder to pirate things, so things are being pirated less, um, or to make it easier to not pirate things. So there's a whole notion of incentive. Um, you know, if they, if they make it very, very hard, where, you know, every single person has to have a bank account, um, then they may be able to do it, but then if you have technology to go around this, and you know, do like the whole VPN kind of stuff. Um, then that's you know, bring us back to this point of a cat and mouse game, and it very much is a cat and mouse game. Uh, you know, technology advances, and then the people want to break that kind of law. Essentially, would advance with technology as well. Um, one interesting example I would give is that um, the Soviets would make um, airplanes, to not helicopters, for about two hundred million dollars let's say and you know the amount it costs to blow one up cost about like a hundred thousand or something just through like you know a tinker rocket or something um that was an example from the soviet afghan war whereby the cia gave the afghans the you know the means and it's a lot cheaper to destroy their technology and you know it's a sort of a war of attrition i think that's what's going to kind of happen i don't think anyone's going to go anywhere i think they're just going to keep migrating um, like a persecuted tribe. Yeah. So they're, they're not going to start their own uh, Israel then. The hair will feel that I, I just, um, in the future it'll be like the Soma pods or something. So mm. well, I'm thinking more of a digital Zion sort of yeah. uh, sort of deal, which will grow yeah. into a new Jerusalem eventually, a giant golden cube. So interesting um, thing. So I was recently. I'm exploring this kind of idea of starting my own city. Um, and I think it's very possible in our lifetime to like for someone to accumulate enough capital. I know a few startups that have got venture funding already um, that are, you know, trying to explore this kind of space. 
And I think, yeah, it is 100% possible to create a city. And again, this is what I mean. There's going to be a fracturing of ideology and just fracturing of nations and just a fracturing of just types of places and lifestyles that you can live in. So I totally believe that there can be like an anonymous Zion whereby, you know, no one knows what anyone does and it's a very crypto um, backed kind of space and all um, transactions in that city are anonymous. I, I don't know the effects of it, um, but I think that, you know, it could happen. Uh, it's very plausible. Uh, you know, it only costs a couple of million to buy, you know, land from a, um, a place and then, you know, you can just try to buy nuclear arms, I suppose, in the future. Uh, and protect your uh, soft core. We'll have Gritland. We'll have well, Gritania. There you go. We'll have uh, Gritania. Mm. Gritania. Yeah, I, 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 I want to recreate the city of Rhodes and call it Grit City. Folk City or something. I don't know. And then, I don't know, I, I found a place on the coast of West Africa. I know a few people in that government that I'm, I'm very close to and we're doing some business deals together. Um, so, like, maybe in 10 years' time it'll be a more plausible kind of scenario. So, I mean, that's definitely on the books in terms of like, you know, most people can actually, you know, buy an island already. And there's going to be more and more crypto millionaires. And if crypto keeps going up and people keep hodling, it'd be very easy for them to, you know, create their own um, place. And I think that pe the fact that people are moving more and more, that, you know, people move from Silicon Valley to, um, you know, Austin, Texas to Miami. I think that just shows that people are willing to move and, you know, work is very flexible nowadays. So, like, you know, you can work in Costa Rica as an animator or whatever, um, and it doesn't really affect the company. And because the fact that it doesn't affect the company, there's a financial incentive to do it. Because, you know, all the best companies are going to be like, hey, you know, you can work remote. You can choose your own hours. Um, well, that, that's interesting how you could think of, like, these people that have micro nations, and you, you'd have, like, a fully integrated crypto uh, nation, like a city-state, where crypto would just be so involved with every conceivable interaction. That's kind of interesting. I mean, maybe some kind of like, I don't know, Peter Thiel or whoever can make a feel good men land or it's, it is an interesting idea. I mean, maybe, but it's just a matter of like it overcoming the brute force. I mean, obviously you'd have to have an incentive that is sort of not easily um, of the ire of power like this is what people said when they, you know, the, you know, original like 2016 alternative right, like these fantasies about the ethno state in Montana or Richard Spencer's uh, Montana ranch. Then people are like, well, that's going to get Waco and like, you know, the day two. Right. But I guess if you had an infrastructure that is maybe away from the like Anglo centers of power like Anglo-British American centers of power, like if you had a micronation off the coast of, I don't know, uh, off the coast of Burkina Faso or somewhere like that, maybe, I mean, it could be feasible. I mean, if the if the global internet is realized, even if the Elon Musk, what what's the Musk program in global internet? Starlink. Starlink, yeah, if that is like a reality, then the whole grid, the whole globe will become like gridded and uh, gritted, and uh, yeah, it'll be <laughs> the whole globe will sort of become territorialized by the hand of man finally. So, whether that's a good thing or not is obviously debatable. Yeah, totally. Uh, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think um, like our notions or views of power are the same. You know, you like, I feel as though you guys think that there is these huge source of power, and I definitely see that, but I also kind of see behind a veil that they're a lot more vulnerable vulnerable than you know that they make out um the very fact that people are rebelling against lockdowns and stuff just goes to show that their power is decreasing and, and i think you know if you are to for instance just go to like let's say uh, venezuela or brazil or something is they, they like they can wake up you but it's going to be again it's going to be a lot harder if you're in a different nation um it's the, the incentives are not there like you know why are we invading these guys What's our incentive? Um, you know, and if, the thing is, it's not, it won't only be just like one tribe of people. It will be like, you know, thousands of them moving, millions if not, uh, you know, moving to all these different locations. And it's going to be huge soft. And it's just, you don't have enough power to do that. I think, um, yeah, like that, that's the main kind of thing. And it, it's not just one kind of people, group of people that are trying to get into power. There's also, you know, there's other, other nation states and their power brokers. Uh, and, 
this whole like you know shifting of power of hands in terms of crypto i don't know it may be a bad thing in the sense that it's, it's gonna you know it's hard to see who the power brokers are going to be um you know who's going to be behind the shadowy veil who's going to be the new illuminati let's say well i for one would love to be uh, the new illuminati and uh, this is why we're uh, working towards uh, getting btr high up there in the chain and meeting all these influential people so I don't know. I mean, at the same time, being Illuminati probably sucks dick as well. To be in that position of power and to have to do things in order to retain that power, it must probably drive a lot of people insane over time. Maybe just like total, uh, you know, total psychopaths are the only ones who can uh, handle that level of influence. And uh, when a normal person is put into that situation, they'll just, uh, I mean, they'll like, just crumble. I mean, after a while, it's just like, are the benefits worth it? I mean, like. You know, if you're that rich, you could just probably live comfortably. So you got to be some sort of like psychologically damaged if you want to keep going. And that's what you kind of see yeah. in the top three is in, in the top elite kind of people. Um, you know, they they have something wrong with them in the sense that um, you know their some of the screws are not not done right. Um, and oh, and by the way, for for the uh, comment uh, for Ricardo Williams, I'm very interested in taking a look at this account that you sent me. The only thing is that uh, this stream right now, it is going to be concluded, and then we're going to have the Ayla Girl stream, and that one, I think, right now is just, uh, it is very full up, and I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk, but I would definitely love to take a look at uh, uh, the person you sent me, and I really appreciate you reaching out to me about that. But uh, when it comes to let's here's what i want to focus on towards the end which is uh, your account picture before it was the planet grit cult you know with grit cult written on there with the netting and now it's the strange very uh, kind of disturbing looking skull with the target sign and the explosion like nuclear explosion can you explain what exactly this is yeah so my pre my my, my previous um i don't know avi avatar essentially was a guy with like a cut off kind of face and um, you know his face is being taken off, and it was kind of a peel back of his anatomy. I'm a big believer of Memento Mori. Um, I'm a big fan of it, and I like mm. um, Reminders of Death. I was kind of brought up with the sense that you know you should always have death in the back of your mind. It should be at the forefront. Um, I, yeah, death should always be at the forefront of your mind. You should always be thinking about death, and death should, in a sense, guide every, your every single action. And in that sense, I'm I'm quite like. Um, I'm very able to like you know not get annoyed by very trivial kind of things in my opinion, mainly because I, I'm always having this kind of thought in my back of mind that if I die I'm not really going to give a shit um, about this trivial thing and you know it kind of um, it makes you immune to a lot of things um, and it focuses you on the longer term picture. So I'm very guided by long term playing, long term games, and long term people is the thing I say often. And I truly mean that in the sense that I am trying to play at the highest level in the regards to, you know, um, what's my life's purpose. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, at least tackle that every single day I'm alive. And, um, you know, it's a very much a motivator. <clears throat> motivator. And I kind of want that, you know, reflecting in my aesthetics. And, and, I, and I, want, I want more people to kind of embrace that sense of death. And I think the, sense, the death sense in modern society has completely gone out the window. I think we kind of idolize youth. Um, you know, mainly due to you know these Hollywood producers who have this kind of fetish, uh, you know, for the young. Let's say. Are you talking uh, about <laughs> Dan the Man? Oh God. <laughs> no, I, I don't know who that is. I'm afraid. Oh, it's Dan Schneider. So um, oh, he was okay, the guy yeah. responsible for all those old school Nickelodeon shows back in the day, like uh, yeah. all that. Keenan Kellogg. I don't know. In uh, England, did you guys have these same uh, TV shows? I never really watched it. Was we were. Um, we were too, too too poor to watch satellite TV, um, so we just had the basic channels. Um, so I, I never really watched Nickelodeon. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm not really familiar. We just had the free channels. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I think I'm familiar with who he is. He posted a lot of feet pics, I think. Um, yes, exactly. And I think even Nickelodeon yeah. had like the uh, foot as their logo at a certain time. Like, they turned Whoa, the Nickelodeon logo into a yeah. giant foot. That's crazy. Um, I, I, I don't know. My personal belief is that, you know, he should be punished in some regard. Um, how, I mean, that's up for debate. But he definitely should be penalized for his crimes in a very severe way. 
Um, I mean, I mean, look, let's if we're talking just like as lawyers here, you know, ale- allegedly, what do we really know about the guy? I mean, there are think, reports but, online and I don't know about how people that are attached to power, especially with Hollywood being the spectacle machine there, they tend to have like really crazy, like sexually charged uh, sort of psychopathologies. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I, I've worked in I worked in the film industry for a little bit, so I totally understand. And it's kind of poisoned my kind of view on a, a lot of things about those kind of people. And I'm totally against um, a lot of their ideologies that they um, say that they support. So, for instance, um, like this whole Nickelodeon thing, I personally think that it's immoral as a society that we have child actors. I think that we should outlaw <laughs> child acting um, mainly because it's, uh, you know, it's, it breaks a lot of child labor laws for one. Um, and yeah, um, you know, it, it's very immoral in my opinion. I mean, that that is part of that. My God, I mean, well, in the future, we're just gonna have like virtual kids, right? Like, we're gonna have virtual meat, we're gonna have virtual kids. I mean, we're gonna probably, I don't know, you may be right that some people would just like to live in a virtual environment, virtual real estate, having their own body, just be in the pod, eating the bugs, but not being aware that they're eating the bugs. Just have the bugs turn into a goo that just like goes through their throat, you know, and just be suspended like that. The term like walled garden is really a good, an apt metaphor for the sort of fragmentation that we're going to experience, which I I thought it's a poetic sort of metaphor. Um, for like how existence will sort of become like, you know, subject to like these different feedback loops and there will be whole like dead zones of like where, you know, whatever you think is like centralized power will not be able to cross, whether it's through crypto or, yeah. And I do like the idea that uh, we were talking about before with these um, nomads, because when I hear the word nomad, I think no mad, I'm not even mad. You know, they're just uh, going to enjoy walking across, you know, the uh, desolate uh, suburbs, the overgrown. Sorry, not even that. De- I mean, they're desolate of people because the people are all going to be inside. But the suburbs are just going to overgrow with flora and fauna and the deer and all that raccoons, all that good stuff. And they're going to make friends with the raccoons, the uh, the nomads. And they're just going to go and, uh, you know, uh, raid certain houses for stuff and just live the good life while everybody's hooked into their uh uh, you know, matrix environment. I don't know that that may happen. <laughs> so right now it is 4:29, and uh, we are gonna have to transition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at this moment to our uh, next event, which is gonna be with a I I can't say the fucking name. Geo, how do we say? Hey, it? Hello, girl. A Ella girl. A Ella girl. Exactly. Oh, but uh, but grid cult. Before we go. Are there any final thoughts of advice, support that you would give to people who are listening to this right now? How you would uh, recommend people who don't have a business yet, uh, short of consulting you, which they definitely should do as well. But for those who are not yet ready to consult you, uh, and of course, there is also the Discord that I'm going to link uh, to as well, your uh, your Discord here. But otherwise, what advice would you give them who want to make their mark on the world in some way, who want to achieve their very best? What are the, what are the first steps here? Um, I suppose the very first steps is, uh, you know, probably reaching out to your network and seeing whether or not your network or your environment is the right place to be. Um, and then kind of reassessing, you know, do you want to be with these kind of people for the rest of your life? Um, and, you know, what value are they bringing to your world? Um, a lot of people are losers because they are surrounded by losers. Um, and, you know, their environment is very much putting them in a negative kind of uh, feedback loop whereby, oh, no, everyone around me is depressed, so I'm depressed. Uh, everyone around me you know, is making low income, so I'll be making low income. And they kind of accept their reality. But, you know, if they were to venture out, and challenge their assumptions, um, they would get a lot further. So number one kind of thing is, you know, take into an audit your environment. I love it. I think that is really well said, Word Cult, and I really appreciate you uh, coming here, talking with us. And uh, yeah, well, I want another one. I mean, we're pressed for time today. 
So please come again. I mean, yes. It, yeah, sounds good. Um, you know, if you guys would have me, that would be a pleasure. It's been really great talking to you guys. And um, I've been watching the comment stream as well. It's been very funny. <laughs> I'm very enjoying. Yeah, so let's see, let's see how the how comment stream is good as well. How could they reach out to you? Or... Oh, yes. Yeah, just uh, reach out to me on Twitter. Um, I, I get a lot of DMs, but I try to answer as many of them as I can. Um, and yeah, but Twitter is probably my best place to go to. Um, aside from that, I would, I would say, um, hmm. yeah, that, that's essentially it. Um, you know, ch find out where your environment is. Uh, start probably going to the gym and um, start, I don't know, start, I suppose, interacting with new people that you don't necessarily agree with. Keep an open mind. Um, there's a kind of a crook, crook recipes to success. If you were to put it in such a cheesy term, but yeah, I mean, like today, today has been a very long day. I only had, I only like ate my first meal at around, um, like just before your call, actually. Um, I was talking to some of the youngest people, and um, and I was having breakfast then, so like 6 p.m. So it's been a very busy day. So I haven't been as energetic as I normally am. Well, I like uh, myself's comment over here. I don't trust this man, but I don't think he's harmful. That is. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cool. All um, right. Thank you. Yeah. Right, Thank guys. you so much. Gosh. I will. I will talk to you really soon. And guys, don't forget to subscribe for all the newcomers here. And don't leave this screen. We are going to transition into the other stream. You will see the link for it. So go there. Get ready because it's coming. So and you know what I mean by it's. The Ayla Girl stream, it is coming, and I'm ending the stream right now. See you soon. Take care, guys.